Number 10, The Lioness of Brittany. We'll kick this part two off with the tale of a fierce pirate named Jeanne de Clisson. Yeah, she wasn't playing around. De Clisson was born into a wealthy aristocratic family. Her parents, Maurice Montague and Latisse de Parthenay, they welcomed this little swashbuckler in the 1300s in the French province of Brittany. Mm, starting to get it now. Her first marriage was young, but it had real love, which is a nice change for this time period and, you know, history in general. Ten years later, in 1326, her husband sadly passed away. He was executed for treason by the French king, although it was false claims and all that jazz. It wasn't really, it was shady. So she went full on rage mode. She sold everything that she owned, including her land, and then got massive warships and just attacked. She equipped these warships with red sails and everything. She was the pirate queen of the English Channel. For the following 13 years, she would wipe out French fleets. Yeah, we're kicking off this list with pirates. Swashbuckle up. In our ninth spot, we have the dollar bill. Now, this is a pretty wholesome one for you all. When a woman named Esther was young, she had written her name on a couple of dollar bills after a bad breakup. She then told herself that she was going to marry the man that brought the bill back to her. Well, years later, she was dating a man named Paul Gratchen. The day he asked Esther to be his girlfriend, they were at a sandwich shop. As he was paying for the meal, he got handed a dollar bill with the name Esther written on it the bill she wrote years prior. And in the end, they ended up getting married. Now, how wholesome is that? The universe literally gave her what she had manifested. Coming in at number eight, we have the girls with the red balloon. In 2001, a 10 year old girl named Laura Buxton decided to release a red balloon from her front yard with a message on it. The balloon said, please return to Laura Buxton and it had her address written on it. Well, this balloon traveled 140 miles and ended up landing on the yard of another 10 year old girl's house. This girl's name was also Laura Buxton. Like what are the odds? The two Laura Buxtons ended up meeting and they discovered that they had tons of similarities, not just their age and name. For example, they both had a guinea pig, a gray rabbit and a three year old chocolate lab. They both also looked alike and dressed alike. I'm telling you, this is just way too freaky. Like, what are the odds? I'm gonna be saying that a lot in this video. What are the odds? Moving on to number seven, we have Mark Twain and Haley's Comet. Every 76 years, Haley's Comet is visible to the naked eye as it soars past Earth. Well, American writer Mark Twain was born on one of Haley's Comet's passing in 1835. The next year that the comet was said to pass was in 1910, and Mark Twain predicted that he was going to die that year. He said that he came into the world with the comet and that he was going to leave the world with the comet as well. And Mark Twain was right. Mark Twain passed one day after the comet's closest approach in 1910. So not only did Mark Twain predict his own death, but his birth and death both seamlessly lined up with Haley's comet. How freaky. In our sixth spot, we have Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup has been named the luckiest woman as well as the unluckiest woman. She also has been given the name Miss Unsinkable, and I'll explain how she got those nicknames in just a second. So Violet was a stewardess and nurse who was on board three big sister ships when disaster struck each of them. It started with the HMS Olympic. She was on board the ship when it collided with the HMS Hawk. Then she was on the HMHS Britannic when it struck a mine at sea. And lastly, she was on board the Titanic and she managed to escape all three of these disasters. At this point, she probably was cursed. And after the first accident, she shouldn't have gotten back on any ships ever again. So that's why she's been given the name, the luckiest, unluckiest woman to live. She's been lucky to survive all the accidents, but unlucky that they kept happening to her. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Danielle Dutoit. The irony behind this next story is mind blowing. So Danielle de Toit was a South African astronomer. Over his life, he discovered and co-discovered several comets. He also spent his days giving lectures. On September 28th, 1981, he gave a lecture on how death can strike anyone at any time. As soon as the lecture was done, he popped a mint into his mouth. The mint then slid to the back of his throat. He choked on it and died right then and there. So yeah, I'd say his lecture was pretty spot on. In our fourth spot today, we have Harry Zigland. Now, this story is kind of controversial. Some say it's an old wives tale. Others say that it actually did happen. 
Now, if it did happen, then this is the definition of karma. So back in the day, there was a man named Harry Zigland who broke a woman's heart. She was so heartbroken that she took her own life. Her brother was so devastated and angry at Harry that he vowed to get revenge on him. So he went out to find Harry with his gun and shot at him. Harry fell to the floor and the brother, thinking that he had succeeded in killing him, grabbed his gun and took his own life. But Harry survived. The bullet didn't strike him. Instead, it hit and got lodged into a nearby tree. Three years later, Henry was using dynamite to remove the tree. When he blew it up, the explosion sent the bullet out of the tree and it hit and instantly killed him. It took karma three years, but it finally caught up to him. Coming in at number three, we have the Hoover Dam. Over the course of the construction of the Hoover Dam, there were 96 deaths. The first death was of a man named J.G. or George Turney. It occurred on December 20th, 1922. He sadly lost his life after drowning in the dam. 14 years later, on the exact anniversary of this guy's death, his son, Patrick Turney, lost his life. He fell from an electrical tower and died. This was also the final death reported during the construction of the dam meaning the first man to die and the last man were father and son, and it happened on the exact same day. Coming in at number two, we have Jack Frost and other stories. Some things are just meant to be, and you'll believe this once you hear this next story. Children's book author Anne Parrish was with her husband in Paris when they stopped by an antique bookshop from the 1920s. While in there, she found a copy of Jack Frost and other stories. She told her husband that that was her favorite book as a child. Well, when he opened the book, it had her name written inside of it. It read Anne Parrish, 209N Weber Street, Colorado Springs. So not only did it have Anne's name in the book, but it had the place she grew up in, Colorado Springs. Seems like Anne was meant to find that book. And in our number one spot today, we have the two presidents. It turns out that Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy share a lot of eerie coincidences. Besides the fact that they both were American presidents, they both were killed by a gunshot wound to the back of the head, they both passed away on a Friday, they both died before a celebration, Kennedy was assassinated on the eve of Thanksgiving, Lincoln died right before Easter, and each were accompanied by their wife and another couple when they were killed. But that's not all. They both had best friends named Billy Graham, both Billys had four children, and they both had secretaries named after the other president. Kennedy's secretary was Miss Lincoln, Lincoln's secretary was John. But wait, there's even more. Both of their successors were vice presidents called Johnson. The freakiest coincidence, Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater. Kennedy was shot in a Lincoln made by Ford. Kicking off the list at number 10, blindfolded gladiators. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn has to blindfold himself and then he still somehow wins? What a moment in time. No dry eyes in the theater at all. Amazing. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull the same trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive events back in the day, they would need to change the formula from time to time. They would have cheap beer nights at the Coliseum, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada. And that's when gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. How insane does that sound? Are you kidding me? I'd go and watch, probably. I don't know. They would also leave the armor inside. They would mostly battle in just sandals and cloth. Yeah, and you thought Marco Polo made you anxious? Try again. They would save these events for criminals, I guess, but like... Come on, it's stealing bread and then fighting a tiger? The Colosseum was a little unfair, gotta admit. Number nine, Immortal Emperor. Ken Shi Hong was trying to find the key to immortality, but in doing so, he met his fate. The first emperor of China caught wind of old myths. Myths about immortality in these three spiritual mountains. And living on these mountains were these immortals. So he searched for what's called the elixir of life. This sounds like Legend of Zelda now a little, I'm not gonna lie, I'm, I'm, I'm into this. He once sent hundreds of young men to the Penglai Mountain. They were sent to retrieve this elixir, but they never returned. Pretty mysterious. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that the contact they were supposed to meet was a thousand year old magician. And no one was there. Odd. His next plan was to get his own alchemist to make immortality pills, but unfortunately they were made of mercury, so those pills were now the cause of his death. 
don't eat mercury. Let's move on. Number eight, the royal rule. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day. She's been known for a few cute, quirky queen things, you know? Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who works there who breaks in new shoes for the queen. That's their, that's their job. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always rubs, you know? If only I were the Queen Elizabeth II. That'd be such a great job, just putting on shoes all day and be like, they feel good. She's so old and sweet, she's like, they look good. One of the craziest things I've ever heard and the reason why we're on this list today is that the queen has a royal rule. Absolutely, positively, no crust on her sandwiches or else. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It runs in the family. Honestly, yeah, damn right it has. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, they viewed anything square-shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I mean, I personally have never thought of funerals while eating grilled cheese sandwiches, but I guess now I will. Thanks, Prince Albert. Imagine that's your job. My hands would be so shaky. I would just eat the crust, just to make sure. I'd do it for the queen. I'd be like, oh, your majesty, yes. Just full of crust mouth. I'm like, that's so dry. Horrible, what a horrible job. I'm gonna cut it off though, I have to just. Number seven, Nero's Golden House. We mentioned the Festival of Drunkenness on part one, so I had to include Nero's Golden House for part two. Yeah, you know, history is crazy when you start to hear these party houses. These rooms specifically made for ancient Roman parties. Nero built one, and it was a massive golden house. He used it every day for years and years just to party and just get drunk and have a good time. We're not even sure how big it was. I mean, some historians say it covered 100 acres of land. This is like Project X in Roman days. It's like Project X LV AD. That's the that's long awaited prequel right there. There we go. This golden house was in the center of Rome and it's important to note that this was also the time where people of Rome were starving. This was one of the last things Nero really did before he was pushed out and pushed off the throne. Ah, you don't say, weird. On top of this golden palace, he had this massive dome, of course containing gold plated walls and an artificial lake, just all the wrong stuff to be focusing on at this time. Inside this main gold room, there's tons of individual rooms inside, but none of them were bedrooms for anybody. What an absolute waste, they were just empty. He built all this just to party with rich visitors four times a week. Yeah, great, great leader. It's a good leader right there. Number six, jesters in battle. Being a professional comedian has gotta be hard work. You can say a thousand hilarious, well thought out bits, but one ill-timed tweet that goes a little too far, well, your entire career is gone. See you later. Well, back in the day, being a professional fool or a jester, it was no different. You needed to find the balance of humor and wit, but it was a lot harder back then, if anything. Most of these jesters were given role of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, yeah, this is where it comes from, historically. The jester would have to tell them bad news, but in a positive way, you know? For example, back in 1340, King Philippe IV, his fleet, his entire fleet, was destroyed in a naval battle. The British completely wiped them out. It was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, Oh, this guy, he brought the news in a positive way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French did. Where if that was some random dude, his knees would be shaking. He has to tell the king horrible news. He's not used to that. Jesters, on the other hand, they're used to farting on the king's lap. They're the ones to advise for sure. No matter what the message was, this jester had to go deliver it. And his, you know, quirky tone. Sometimes the jester would kick off an entire battle, middle of a field. He would have to go and demand the opposing side to retreat while also roasting them at the same time. It's the king's way of getting the enemy to attack first, know what I mean? So they send the jester to go and talk. But he's also a jester. He can say whatever he wants to get you riled up. That's the best part. He just runs up like, hey, the king said he doesn't want to fight anymore. Yeah, land's all yours. Apparently he has something called ligma. Number five, a lot of food. This next one, honestly, I think we can do it, Chris. I'm not gonna lie. The right day, I think we could both probably do this. Back in 1720, the Manchu Han Imperial Feast was the ultimate dining experience. I do all you can eat sushi every now and then with the guys. This was like, whew, next level. Historically, besides a food fest, this was a peace offering between both the Manchu and Han Chinese. The emperor, Exanui, hosted the celebration on his birthday, which to that I say, great timing. What better way to spend your 66th birthday than to eat 300 different dishes from both parties? Let's do it. Leopard meat, rhino tail, camel humps, just insane items on this menu to begin with, first of all, all in one go. Yeah, it's not like Caesar salad and then Greek salad and then maybe wings tossed in hot, ooh, to get cheeky. No, it's massive animals, like here's your rhino, what else do you want? Hope you're hungry. One restaurant today still offers those services for such a dinner party, in case you're interested. It only cost you about $54,000, so maybe bring a date? I don't know. Chris, what are you doing after work? Done. Number four, mouse skin eyebrows. Stuart Little, if you're watching this, 
you're gonna wanna cover those little, those little eyes, trust me. In the 1800s, the cosmetic game was a bit harsh. Yeah, it turns out eyebrows had a rough go. Okay, let's talk about it. Eyebrows back then were completely plucked off in the 1800s in order to make the forehead look bigger. That was the key to finding true love in the 1800s. You just needed a, you just needed a five head, apparently. This idea didn't last forever, thankfully, but before it got better, it had to get worse. In the late 17th and early 18th century, ladies would completely shave their eyebrows off and then glue on mouse skin. And the glue game was weak back then too, so they only had one shot. Better eyeball that, you better hope it's good or else you'll be like, Looking like that all day. Good evening, sir. <laughs> Number three, heart of glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. History is wild. The 23 year old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature. It was a hobby of hers, dare I say. But she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she had swallowed a piano made up entirely of glass. When she was a child, she just gulp and ate a piano. So she says, she grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. Every time my voice cracked growing up, I should have said that instead. I should have been like, oh, sorry, it's my inner glass piano. It's just untuned. Shut up, man. This was a real issue though. She would enter a room slowly and sideways, like to avoid cracking that personal piano problem. That's wild, imagine seeing this. But just like King Charles VI, he thought he was gonna break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion, but we've seen it in royals more than once, so no one knows what's going on. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. The play is called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. It's pretty new, so if you have a chance to support some wild history in theater, go for it. Number two, the anti-theft briefcase. Morning commutes can be quite hectic, and today we thankfully have slim, safe anti-theft backpacks, so you don't have to worry about losing any belongings in your early morning rush. Well, in the late 1950s, they had anti-bandit bags, which had a couple of Neat tricks. You ever want to feel like Inspector Gadget on your way to work? Here you go. The first one came out in 1959. Banks were being robbed while transporting cash quite often, so the smoke bag came out. Red mist would cover the not so smooth criminal or scare them away. Cool. So far we're working. 1963, here comes the anti-bandit bag. Well, what does this bag do, you ask? Well, at the push of a button, all of the bag's contents will be emptied. Just thrown all over the street. Sick. Now that's what I call a solution right there. Hey, give me that file. He's like, da, I take them all. The bag that empties its own contents. Okay, inventor John Rinfret was tired of being robbed all the time, so he designed this briefcase to, you know, as a solution. Where if you turn your thumb the wrong way accidentally, you're hilariously late for work. Yeah, my briefcase almost got stolen and then I had to gather all of my things. Horrible morning, the worst, sorry I'm late. And finally, number one. Ice Palace. If you liked Frozen, you'll get a kick out of this one. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. This crazy, okay, let's talk about her. What's going on with this? To celebrate the victory of the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house. Sure, out of all the things, that's how we're gonna celebrate. Cool, grab your jackets. Sorry, an ice palace. A palace. It's gotta be big and palace-like. She's a queen who just won battles. If I was there, I would 100% have just licked the walls. I've always wanted to go to an ice hotel and just see how many licks I can get in before getting kicked out. They're like, what's that guy doing? Stop him! The building starts leaning, I'm like, He's ruining the wall. This palace was huge. It was 20 meters by 50 meters, so a lot of ice to lick. And inside there were ice trees, ice birds, and ice, you, you get the point. To make it even more ridiculous, Anna arranged a marriage with a prince and one of her maids. They didn't know each other. They were forced to ride an elephant together. And on top of that, all the guests were dressed up like clowns. This had to be number one, right? You see, it was a nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold, literally dressed like clowns. You know it was so slippery too. Like they're like, whoa, what a waste of time. What a joke. Starting off this countdown, we have Jean-Marie Duberry. On February 13th, 1746, a French man named Jean-Marie was executed for the murder of his father. Hundreds of years later, on the exact same day, a man named Jean-Marie Duberry was also sentenced to death. He had also taken the life of his father. So what are the odds that two unrelated people with the same name both killed their fathers and then got executed on the same day? Like that is just way too free. Number nine, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane, I had to throw it in here. Elmer McCurdy, back in 1911, so a bit more recent than the Coliseum days, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather it was full of passengers. So he collected a whopping $46 instead. Instead of a gold heist, he got $46, which back in the day was still, that was still not bad, I'm not gonna lie. Things were going fine until he was shot by a lawman. Now this is when things start to get really insane 
insane. Elmer's body was embalmed and then sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost. And for the next 60 years, his body was passed around as a prop. It was sold between haunted houses, wax museums, that kind of stuff. Check out this guy who tried to do this and blah, blah, blah. Such as I'm doing now, but I would have his body here. I don't know, people are weird. Eventually, the guy's body, like his real body, don't forget, ended up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Come 1976, there's a crew there filming the movie The Six Million Dollar Man. And that's when Elmer's finger broke off, revealing that it was an actual mummy and not a prop on the set. They went to film The Six Million Dollar Man and ended up finding The Forty Six Dollar Man in real life. That is so gross. Imagine that. Some guy with a boom mic's like, um. Number eight. Fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of seeing, you know, things that they love get blown to smithereens, more than fair. So they figured, let's try and fool the Germans flying overhead. Let's just build a fake Paris. Yeah, a fake Paris. Let's psych them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. This life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. And it worked. This tiny town called Mason's Lafitte, now of course it's looking a lot more full. Now it's like a rich town, not fake buildings, but actual real buildings where rich people live. That's fun. There were three different zones set up just in case anything were to drop around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations and mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake guard Nord train station. That was the whole pull over there. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafitte, the main fake Paris city I just talked about. And zone C was the industrial area. So basically it was just east of the city and they had a massive factory built with literally nothing inside of it. Just a big shell. This sounds a lot like Home Alone, just on a larger scale when you think about it. But with these missions only happening overnight back then, creating a light show with some big props wasn't a bad idea. Lights were carefully spaced out on the ground so it looked like a breathing city from above. Check it out. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. How amazing is that? Number seven, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, one man, one, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, great nickname, he had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed that any British soldier going into battle without a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack here, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championships. So not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow. Yeah, like an Avenger. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to officially taken out an enemy in combat by using a longbow, which is pretty cool. But here's the most intimidating part about him. Before combat, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes, right before drawing his sword and then running at you in battle. Can you imagine? That's some Game of Thrones stuff. A dude ripping the bagpipes, dropping it, and then sprinting at you full on with a sword and a longbow? Good game. I would just fold. I'd throw my on the ground. I'd be like, nope. You win. Take it. Take off the land. Number six, Ball the Burning Men. If you're gonna party like it's 1999, at least do so safely, you know? Back in 1393 in Paris, these knights would put on these fun party performances for the king. They would dress up and pretend that they were wild beasts. They would soak their armor with shrubbery and dry grass and hay. They would stuff it, anything to make them look like, I don't know, a hairy beast almost? Which first of all, great bit, pretty itchy. Honestly, great commitment. The party was going well and they planned for these wacky performances, so they had to ban candles and torches from this room. Room. The king's brother, he was drunk, maybe he was, you know, at a festival of drunkenness prior, I don't know. He walked in with a torch and all hell broke loose. He got too close to one of these knights, one of these stuffed knights, and well, he caught on fire and yeah, you could probably figure out the rest. It was bad news. Number five, coffee ban. This is the worst of the worst right here, halfway, let's do it. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. This guy banned coffee. Yeah, what an absolute monster. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because, you know, he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he put forth these laws just because he could, and he made these laws punishable by death, so he wasn't playing around. Yeah, this guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a party pooper. He would take this so seriously as well, he would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around the streets aimlessly in hopes that he would catch one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you weren't charged or anything like that, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off your head right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. How horrible is that? No coffee, could you imagine getting your head because you had a coffee? Get out of here. 
Number 4. Royal Curse The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. A storm had flooded a cathedral in Vilnius and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area. God forbid it flooded, obviously. But on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. No one has found them at any point before. These remains were still buried with the crown. It was like a whole scene untouched. It was from the 15th century. What a find, right? Sadly, the flood ended up ruining all of these remains, and this is when things start to get a little mysterious. All those involved in these findings began to die in unusual circumstances afterwards. One professor had died after falling down a lift shaft in his apartment. Another guy died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues, but apparently it was sketchy or not supposed to happen. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed randomly at 62. A sculptor also involved died when untying his shoelace, so a freak accident. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt again. I hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were legitimately trying to preserve history and avoid the crypt flooding. We need a Ouija board to clear this whole situation up. We need one guy to be like, hey, by the way, just explain everything. Number three, the festival of drunkenness. Wait, is this an actual thing? Hold on. Nowadays, we have parties for just about everything. There's a baby on the way, let's party. Baby just came out, let's party. Baby turned one, now we got a party at like 11 a.m. We just love celebrating, we'll find excuses to celebrate. Well, the festival of drunkenness in Egypt back in the 15th century just, well, they got right to the point. Just drink your faces off. That's it. This religious event, and yeah, you heard me, religious event, was to celebrate the Egyptian sun god, Ra. And the story goes as such. Ra stopped the end of the world, way back in the day, when Hathor was planning on devouring all of life. So Ra successfully thwarted their plan by getting them drunk off 7,000 jars of beer. That's a lot of IPAs, oh my. The beer was dyed red to look like blood. Hashtag pranked ya. So now the god was so drunk that it couldn't, you know, devour everybody. So ancient Egyptians would order this again, religious event, by getting absolutely plastered. If you didn't pass out, that was considered offensive, like not burping after a meal. Also, Drink responsibly. Number two, Caesar and Caligula. Running the clock back to 12 CE, Gaius Caesar, aka Caligula, aka the Roman emperor at the time, apparently he was close with his horse. I had two dogs growing up, I would ride or die for those little piggies, okay? I get it, I'm an animal lover myself. And if I had the money, yeah, I would probably make them a house, just for them just to run around with and all that jazz. Well, he gave his horse a marble stall, and it got to the point where they were so close, Caligula was about to appoint the horse to high office of council, but he was taken out. Imagine if he had lived and this happened, what would those meetings look like? What would they smell like, rather? I don't want to know. Let's move on. And finally, coming in number one, Adrian Carton de Wyatt. Over the course of six decades and four wars, Lieutenant General Adrian Carton de Wyatt survived the impossible multiple, multiple times. He's considered one of the most dedicated soldiers of all time because, well, for starters, after he lost his left hand and his left eye, Adrian did not retire. In fact, the British Army officer went on to experience 10 more horrible injuries. As World War I broke out in November 1914, Carton was serving and he was opposing the forces of the Dervish state. In doing so, he was shot in the arm and face, that's how he lost his left eye, but a grim detail shared by Lord Ismay, who served alongside the soldier, said in 1964 that the doctor at the time couldn't do anything, not a single thing, about his eye. So he must have been in pure agony the entire time. Literally, he must have been just the, the worst pain. Lord Ismay continues to believe that losing his eye was actually a blessing in disguise because the incident allowed for Adrian to relocate to Europe where even more action was waiting for him. Once stationed in Europe, Adrian received wounds to the head, hand, stomach, groin, leg, ankle, all by bullets, all a bad time. And if that's not inspiring enough, he survived numerous plane crashes and a broken back afterwards. If you feel like reading more incredible details about the soldier and the diplomat, there's a book on his whole life. And yeah, it's more interesting than I just made it sound. Thank you.